In this video, we have two functions, f and g, which both have limits as x tends towards c, which are equal to l and m respectively. And now I'm going to define a new function called h, and h of x is defined to be equal to f of x plus g of x. Now what I want to show in this video is that the limit as x tends towards c for h of x is equal to the sum of these two limits, l plus m. So this is what I want to prove in this video. In other words, what I want to prove is that for whatever value of epsilon that you come up with, I can always find a value of delta that's larger than zero, such that if x is within a distance of delta away from c, then this implies that h of x is within a distance of epsilon away from l plus m. So this is what I want to show in this video. If I can establish this epsilon delta definition, then I would have essentially proved this. So in order to establish the epsilon delta definition, I'm going to first focus on this term over here. So you see we have this h of x minus l plus m. So what I want to show is that I can make this term arbitrarily small, provided that x is sufficiently close to c. That's what I want to prove. I want to show that for whatever value of epsilon, as long as I can make x sufficiently close to c, then this term can be smaller than whatever epsilon that I come up with. So then we're going to first focus on this term, and in order to establish the epsilon de the definition, I'm going to manipulate this term a bit. So h instead of h of x, I'm going to express this as f of x plus g of x, which is the definition of what h of x is. And then I'm going to group some of the terms together, so I can group the f of x and l together, and I group the g of x and m together, so I get something like this. And then I'm going to invoke the triangle inequality, which states that the absolute value of a plus b is always smaller than or equal to the absolute value of a plus the absolute value of b. So I used the same result in the previous video, so the technique is pretty similar. So this entire term is smaller than or equal to f of x minus l plus g of x minus m. And you'll notice that these two terms actually come up in the epsilon delta definition of these two limits. And we're already given that these two limits exist. So what that means is that if x is made sufficiently close to c, then these two terms can be made arbitrarily small. So that means this entire term can be made arbitrarily small, provided that x is sufficiently close to c, which is actually what we wanted to show in the first place. So what I'm going to do next is I'm going to show you the mathematical details behind how we can make these two terms arbitrarily small by making x sufficiently close to c. So in order to achieve this, first of all, notice that the fact that these two limits exist implies that for whatever value of epsilon that you come up with, I know for sure that, first of all, there must exist a number, let's say delta 1, such that if x is within a distance of delta 1 away from c, this automatically implies that f of x will be within a distance of epsilon over 2 away from l. So you might be wondering why I've divided epsilon by 2. I did the same thing in the last video, and it's perfectly valid for me to do this because uh, the epsilon delta definition states that no matter how small I make this term, I can always find a value of delta such that this entire statement is true. So it's perfectly valid for me to divide this by 2. And in the end, you'll see that eventually uh, things will work out uh, as I complete the proof. And you'll see in the end why we need to divide this term by 2. It's pretty similar to the last video. And I can do the same thing for g of x. So I know for sure that there must exist some term uh, delta 2 such that if x is within a distance of delta 2 away from c, this automatically implies that g of x will be within a distance of epsilon over 2 away from m. So now I'm going to define a new term called delta that's equal to the minimum of delta 1 and delta 2. And since delta is defined in such a way, if x is within a distance of delta away from c, then that value of x will automatically satisfy these two terms. And so automatically these two terms will immediately be implied. So the fact that if x is within a distance of delta away from c, this will automatically imply that both f of x minus l and g of x minus m is smaller than epsilon over 2. So the fact that delta is the minimum of these two terms implies that both of these conditions will be fulfilled. So this condition will imply that both of these conditions are fulfilled. So both of these con uh, statements will be true. So I know that this one condition will satisfy, uh, will immediately imply 
these two statements. So now using this fact here, we can actually move on to uh, completing our proof. So now we're ready to construct the complete epsilon delta definition. So for whatever value of epsilon that you come up with, I'm now going to define delta to be equal to the minimum of delta 1 and delta 2, with delta 1 and delta 2 being defined in such a way. And then we know that if x is within a distance of delta away from c, then this will imply that for the term h of x minus l plus m, then this entire term, as we have shown before, is smaller than or equal to f of x minus l plus g of x minus m. And since x is within a di distance of delta away from c, then we know that automatically that both of these terms will be smaller than epsilon over 2. So that means both of these terms will be smaller than epsilon over 2. So this entire term here is smaller than epsilon over 2 plus epsilon over 2. So you see why we have these uh, over 2 signs here for the two epsilons, because you can add them up together, and then you will get epsilon. So if x minus c is smaller than delta, then this automatically implies that h of x minus l plus m is smaller than epsilon. And so this essentially completes our proof. So what we've shown is that there indeed does exist a value of delta for whatever value of epsilon, such that if x minus c is smaller than that value of delta, then h of x minus l plus m will be smaller than epsilon. So we can make h of x arbitrarily close to the value l plus m, provided that x is sufficiently close to c. And so this essentially completes our proof. So this tells us that the limit as x tends towards c for h of x is indeed equal to l plus m. And some people might like to write this out as the limit as x tends towards c for f of x plus g of x is equal to the limit x tends towards c of f of x plus the limit x tends towards c of g of x, which is equal to l plus m. So this is essentially what we've proved in this video.